and welcome to Newsroom. I'm Sharmeen Ali. The U.S. administration has indicated that it wishes to have fresh ties with Pakistan, and with this they wish to engage further at high level uh, engagement with Pakistani officials as opposed to the structured dialogue that was previously present with the Obama administration. Uh, also, uh, U.S. envoy Zalme Khalil Zad has met with President Ashraf Ghani and uh, brought him up to date about the, their new uh, wish and efforts for uh, peace efforts in Afghanistan. This is after the efforts and the talks had come to a stall last month and President Donald Trump had announced that uh, the peace talks were going to come to an end. So now there's an indication that a revival of those peace talks is in place at the moment. Now Pakistan is, uh, uh, Indian occupied Kashmir has entered its third month, it's actually ending its third month of occupation uh, after the illegal annexation by Indian authorities on August 5th. This is the third month of the blackdown and it's also uh, the uh, third month of the blackout and it's also the third month of the gross human rights violations in that area. There's a entire communications blackout and even though the Indian authorities wish to make it appear as if things have returned to normal. Things are definitely not back to normal. We've discussed this uh, several times on our programs from accounts coming from occupied Kashmir, from people who are in touch with their family members and all who are abroad or over here, and journalists who have managed to get there from international publications. Things are still not back to normal. And yesterday on 27th of October, the entire nation and the world observed uh, Kashmir Black Day uh, where all the atrocities that are taking place in Indian occupied Kashmir due to the lockdown and the blackout in that region. Um, there was an additional reason other than the historical perspective why Pakistan and the world was observing this particular day specifically um, uh, as a black day. Um, also, um, yesterday Pakistan, uh, the Pakistani authorities denied Prime Minister Modi uh, his, uh, they, they denied his the airspace rights to Prime Minister Modi, who was flying to Saudi Arabia, and they refused to allow him to use Pakistani airspace in observance of this Black Day and due to the human rights atrocities in occupied Kashmir. So we will be discussing all of these uh, with our guests in our studio today. Today we have with us uh, Professor Dr. Adnan Sarwar Khan, who is the head of the Department of International Relations in Namal University. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Sir, um, so these are significant developments that the U.S. Uh, administration wishes uh, to restart and uh, with, with fresh ties with Islamabad. And they're also, uh, they've, they've also gone ahead to mention that they want to have extensive high-level engagements with Pakistan as opposed to what the previous government with uh, President Obama used to have, which was a structured dialogue, which was basically that um, occasionally uh, government officials and military officials would meet diplomats, etc., uh, on, on an ongoing basis. This is uh, sort of more higher level. Would you like to comment on what uh, significance does this hold? Well, uh, Ms. Shermaine, actually, I'll try to develop as quickly as possible a small reference to context, if not in detail, sure. at least briefly. In fact, uh, <clears throat> United States-Pakistan relations ever since its inception, uh, right in the early 50s or late uh, uh, 40s, had been uh, such that uh, sometimes they had been quite close and sometimes not at all that close. In fact, sometimes Pakistan was also known as the most allied ally of the United States of America when it entered into U.S. military camps during the uh, Cold War period. But then it was also termed as, uh, very ironically, as the most sanctioned ally. But one thing which was of a, a prime importance was when 9-11 <coughs> occurred, when it was General uh, Musharraf's rule, the U.S. leadership at the presidential level started saying that one-liner that from now onwards uh, in order to remove all such misunderstanding that were there on the nuclear issue etc etc as well uh, in addition to the others uh, that it would have its relations on two bases number one that relation should be long term and number two broad based however uh, well at the end of general musharraf's regime the United States again became a little disgruntled and it thought that well, Pakistan was not doing as much as it was expecting from Pakistan regarding uh, uh, fight against uh, uh, so-called terrorists. Uh, so, so because of that, misunderstandings um, again emerged. And then there was a very, very serious thing that uh, in addition to Afghanistan, 
you, you, you know, the Indian government also was trying to have a very, very close interaction uh, at the strategic level with the United States of America. That further alienated Pakistan and the United States of America. Nevertheless, this is not to say that the rest of the aspects of relations were not working. USAID program and uh, United States uh, Educational Foundation were quite active in Pakistan. And people-to-people -people relations and scholars exchange, that was also going all right. But the point is that, again, when now uh, President uh, Trump, uh, earlier on he was quite uh, uh, critical that this much of uh, billions of dollars had been given to Pakistan. Pakistan didn't do that work for which it was given overall. You know mm -hmm. it that that was something very, very serious. Allegation Pakistan clarified. And then Pakistan actually just wanted to say to the United States of America that, well, it wanted to have uh, relations with the United States of America, but, but with respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was also the line that has been now since last year or so been uh, adopted by uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan. And so, rightly so. Just uh, one more yeah. point and then we can enter into the second question. So now I think finally the United States of America has realized, I would say again, in the inverted commas, that now again it has to be a restart. Uh, but this is one good thing that despite all these uh, suspicions, etc., mostly from the side of the United States, very unfortunately, it realizes sooner than later that Pakistan is too important a com country to be ignored and that Pakistan sacrifices in many, on many matters, but particularly in war against terrorism, mm -hmm. where we have lost some 50 uh, to 60,000 souls and uh, I mean, billions of dollars of uh, loss already has been uh, has, uh, incurred. So in, in that view, I think Pakistan is very, very badly needed to them on many matters, but particularly on Afghanistan. And also that it's just not Afghanistan, it's China also, it's Muslim world also, it's a great manpower that Pakistan has, the youth bulge as well, and the uh, uh, people of Pakistan who have been so tremendously contributing in United States of America in different professions. Right, absolutely. So, sir, uh, now, for the first approximately one year of President Trump's administration, they refused to engage or have anything to do with, they distanced themselves from Pakistan, and President Trump accused Pakistan of a lot of things. But since uh, the U.S. asked, sought for Pakistan's sort of role in bringing about the talks with the Taliban in Afghanistan, that was a turning point between our relationship with the United States. So um, can you comment a bit on that, that point where everything changed? And then Prime Minister Imran Khan then went across to Washington and met, actually met with President uh, Donald Trump and then managed to sort of turn around the perception of Pakistan that, no, we're not harboring terrorists and we are going to fight against uh, terrorism as well. And, no te you know, and he, he dispelled that whole myth that India was trying to spread around the world about Pakistan. Yes, this is what Pakistan has been saying time and again since long. And, um, and due to the reasons uh, known to the United States uh, better, but I would say that in this context, uh, some countries to our left and right, east and west, I may not name them openly. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that they didn't play a significant, a positive role, and they kept on uh, fomenting certain distrust between the uh, United States mm -hmm. and Pakistan for their advantages. Mm -hmm. But I think whenever there's a reappraisal of the policies, there some wise people and those who uh, are uh, the ones who are real, really the strategic policy planners, and they they come to this conclusion that, well, uh, notwithstanding the criticism leveled against Pakistan by different quarters uh, in its neighborhood to begin with, Pakistan has tremendously contributed towards uh, overall uh, regional peace. And uh, as you have been just telling that uh, our prime minister played a very positive role in convincing uh, the United States that, well, stalled negotiations can be restarted. The mm -hmm. foreign minister also was hopeful. Yeah. And the uh, United States uh, itself was banking quite a lot on Pakistan, that Pakistan would, go, uh, would, would, would become the go-between. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has done so. And it, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the f phenomena of negotiations which got stalled, you see, has again almost resumed at informal level. And I'm very sure that Pakistan is very confident that uh, the formal negotiations between the United States and Taliban would all. But 
uh, the main catalyst in this indeed was Pakistan. Right, okay, so um, the US officials also, they welcomed the establishment of a hotline between the Director General's military operations of the Indian and Pakistani side. So can you comment on the significance well, of this? Well, <coughs> the United States the uh, has, one, uh, has one very positive role throughout um, and this also has to be accepted uh, very, very uh, truly. And that is that whenever there had been such stands of an eyeball to eyeball situation, mm -hmm. I would say, between the armed forces of two countries, United States has always been trying to disengage the mm -hmm. two and lower the temperatures between the two countries, the armed forces and uh, political leadership. This time round also, they uh, are trying to convince uh, the leadership of the two countries that well, uh, diplomatic and uh, way and negotiated settlement way has to be adopted. And one good thing uh, in, in favor of Pakistan is that they are trying to impress upon India that uh, the Indian uh, authorities there in occupied Kashmir must lift a ban on internet, cell phones, etc., etc., freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. And so much so that President uh, Trump, uh, in his uh, very first meeting with our Prime Minister, had offered to be uh, a facilitator or uh, uh, someone who is going to mediate between mm -hmm. the two countries, provided India accepts. Now, till date, India, uh, let alone that it is uh, going to accept uh, uh, President Trump's offer, uh, mm -hmm. it is not even ready to bilaterally talk to Pakistan mm -hmm. on Kashmir. Yeah. But uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State, uh, Ms. Ellis Wells, also has been stating to Pakistan and India to be peaceful. And it is behind the scenes, we know it well, that it uh, always tries to cool down the two countries' uh, military leadership and political leadership so that uh, the, the region uh, doesn't get destabilized. Right. So this is one very positive role which the United States, along with very friendly countries like China and Saudi Arabia and certain other countries also have been doing. So, yes, here you see we have to give full marks to them, right. and, but, so, but indeed they have their own limitations. I mean, uh, they, uh, Indians probably are quite adamant at the moment uh, not to budge uh, as long as possible on this Kashmir matter. Right. So, um, in recent meetings with both Indian and Pakistani leaders, President Trump, um, he has discussed with both leaders about Kashmir very directly. And he continues, as per the U.S. officials, uh, that he, he continues to engage them over the telephone and in meetings, etc., about Kashmir, although um, their main role at the moment is not to try and um, make India do anything or anything uh, or Pakistan, but to encourage that at some point or the other a dialogue resumes. So, in your opinion, um, it, what is uh, the, the chance that a dialogue is going to resume? Because there are trust elements on both sides, mistrust elements. India says that we want guarantees about uh, there not being terror camps. Pakistan has shown plenty of times that there aren't. So do you see, do you foresee any kind of such dialogue? Well, uh, I think sooner than later, and if I'm not, uh, if I not, uh, if I may not use this uh, sentence, um, somehow, uh, uh, not very late, but definitely, uh, if not sooner than later, but definitely you see uh, Pakistan and India would come uh, on the way of negotiations. And, uh, but you see, at the moment, as long as India is in the process of what it sees, says and sees, um, and the uh, controlling of the situation in uh, the Indian held Kashmir, uh, and its allegation that uh, in addition to whatever is the uh, indigeneity of the Kashmiri people is an uh, unparalleled struggle, Pakistan is also helping uh, it a lot uh, politically, morally and uh, diplomatically. And uh, when it gets convinced that yes, whatever they are trying to say to the world, uh, though not convincingly at all, that Pakistan is sending certain uh, elements from uh, across the border, so if uh, a better sense prevails, then it would indeed when the world would not accept that anymore, that pretext right. of Prime India. Minister Imran Khan has repeatedly yes. said that there will be no Yes, and you know the Pakistani DG ISPR uh, mm. uh, took with him uh, the diplomats of many countries uh, a couple of days ago on the line of control where the Indian chief was saying that some 
terrorists comes, so-called were busted out, you yeah. see. So, uh, this is it, you see, seeing is believing and those all uh, that, that was excellencies have uh, admitted that there was no such thing there. Right. And so, even the Indian uh, nation, I mean, those people who are writing, they, they are anchor persons and retired journals and politicians, some of them who are truthful, you see, they are also almost I mean, uh, sarcastically laughing at their army chief's uh, uh, claims. Right. So, I think, yes, uh, the only way finally is going to be the dialogue, though, uh, it, is, it is quite difficult to state that whether the dialogue would succeed, but mere commencement of the dialogue yeah, itself would be important. a great issue. So now uh, the U.S. officials uh, were also saying that based on the work done with the talks in Afghanistan, now they would also like to expand the relations with Pakistan uh, based on all the, the facilitation that Pakistan has done for the United States and they'd like to go further into trade and investment. So what opportunities lie in that field of trade and investment with the United States for Pakistan? Well, <clears throat> pa United States has been a very important destination for the Pakistani trade. And in this context, you see, if at all, but this has been a desire which is there for over the decades, I would say. Uh, United States one-to-one -one, uh, can be a good economic partner as is the EU. Sir, as in the meeting of Prime Minister Imran Khan, President Trump, President Trump said that we can increase our trade with Pakistan 10 times, even 100 times. He, he showed his willingness to do that as yes, well. Yes, indeed, you mm -hmm. see, indeed, I mean, uh, the high-tech kind of industries can be, investment can be brought of the United States here. And similarly, the uh, uh, Pakistani companies can be given some kind of a waiver there in investment in different kind of, particularly to those uh, uh, areas where Pakistan excel. So in, in that sense, I think there is always a, but I would say one thing on this again, that this all depends on how much truly Pakistan understands Pakistan as a respectable country. Not a pro part of the problem whether towards India or towards Afghanistan or towards the rest of the other metros, but part of, part of solution. So this has been quite often stated by them. But then they again somehow the, the, the third countries come in and they are carried away by their uh, vicious uh, policies and propaganda. So now the, the, the most important thing is that the United States makes it as a consistent policy, a long term policy where you see the issue to be issue, the issue to issue approach is not adopted and it is a state to state approach, something which Pakistan and China have been demonstrating to the world. Mm -hmm. So if they uh, take Pakistan on the issue to issue basis and require Pakistan only when Pakistan is strateg uh, tactically or strategically needed, so then you see the normal relation would definitely continue. Pakistan says that United States is very important, that's the sole superpower till to date. So Pakistan would not like to have any kinds of a problem with United States, why it should have. But then United States of America should also be uh, uh, treating Pakistan as a respectable country right, and it should not be seeing Pakistan through the Indian or the Afghan lenses. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Adnan Sarah Khan, for joining us today on the program. Thank you. Stay with us. After the break, we're going to be speaking about the recent developments where uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, the U.S. envoy for Afghanistan, met with President uh, Ashraf Ghani in Kabul. So we'll talk about that after the break. Stay with us, please. It's time for Maghrib prayers in Rawalpindi, Islamabad. People in other parts of the country may offer their prayers according to their local timings. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة Sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He who does not respect elders, does not have mercy on children, does not commend what is good, and does not forbid what is evil, is not one of us. Welcome back. Uh, so now we're going to continue our program on a discussion about what's happening, the developments with the peace talks in Afghanistan. Uh, U.S. envoy Zalmi Khalil Zad met with President Ashraf Ghani uh, to talk to him about the future of the uh, peace talks. And it seems like there might be a resumption in the future that we're seeing of the peace talks and there might be a peace settlement uh, coming up. We're going to talk about this with our guests in our studio today. We have with us Mr. Hassan Khan, who's a journalist and a, he's an anchor person and an analyst. And he um, has a vast knowledge on Pakistan and Afghanistan. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank joining us. Thank you very us. much. So, uh, sir, uh, now this recent meeting with uh, Zalmi Khalil Zad and President Ashraf Ghani, that has happened. Prior to that, uh, you had a meeting with Zalmi Khalil Zad and the Taliban right here in Islamabad. And after that, you've also had uh, U.S. Defense Secretary uh, Mark Esper, who arrived in Af Afghanistan mm -hmm. as well <clears throat> recently and uh, met with the people over there. And before that, you also had Nancy Pelosi, who was Speaker of the House in the U.S., uh, in Afghanistan, to meet the officials over there. So are we, uh, does this, all of this indicate that um, the stalled peace talks, the peace talks which stalled last month uh, when President Trump called them off, does this indicate that there is going to be a new resumption in these peace talks? Thank you very much, Shirmin. I think it's a lot, as you mentioned, uh, is going on uh, on the Afghan front. Uh, but uh, fortunately, unfortunately, is the U.S. and the Taliban, uh, which are on the front. Uh, the other parties, especially the Afghan government and the people of Afghanistan, are so far missing uh, from the whole process. Uh, you are right that Zalmay Khalil Zad uh, arrived in Kabul on Saturday last, and uh, he is also accompanied by. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State Lisa Kurtz, and she's also there. And um, he's he's in he's in Kabul uh, after visiting Pakistan, China, and uh, in Beijing. And there was a there was a very good interaction between Pakistan, China, and the U.S. and uh, and, and Russia in in, in Moscow. Uh, so as far uh, on the Afghan front, uh, there's the, the fairly enough discussion going on how to end this war. 
uh, it's, it's about the U.S. withdrawal forces of uh, U.S. forces withdrawal from Afghanistan. And today, it's 28 and 29. There was a scheduled meeting between the Taliban and the intra-Afghan, uh, what we call it, the Afghan-Afghan talks, uh, supposed to be in Beijing. So far, there is no news of it. But uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, tomorrow the second day. So uh, the, the, the most important thing is Abzalmei Khalilzad being in Kabul. And he's not only meeting with the government people, he has met almost with, with the entire uh, spectrum of political uh, leadership in, in, in Kabul, uh, with the jihadi commanders, with the, with the opposition parties, with the government leaders, uh, and with the civil society also. So he is exchanging, I think. Uh, the U.S. desire to resume uh, talks, uh, but it's more Taliban who want the talk to be resumed again. Uh, Definitely, Zalmay Khalilzad is in Kabul, and he is sharing notes with the Kabul administration and with the people, uh, with the leadership uh, in Afghanistan about his interaction, last interaction he has with the Taliban in Islamabad, um, and how the U.S. is going to further carry it out. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, that the talks will resume uh, soon, uh, but the devil lies when, uh, when, 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 uh, when you go into the details, uh, particularly when the Afghan Afghans start talking and about the future settlement of the, uh, of the administration in Kabul. Right. So um, previously, um, we've, we've seen that there were nine rounds of talks between the U.S. officials and the Taliban. And right when they're about to just about, they had agreed to everything and the peace agreement was about to be signed, it seems that uh, somebody, some, some were backed out and ostensibly was due to the fact that a U.S. soldier was killed in Afghanistan. And now we're seeing that the talks, um, the Taliban wishes, as you're saying, to resume the talks. Now, um, uh, in, in keeping all of this in perspective, we also have uh, Afghanistan uh, presidential election that just took place. The results are due to come out next month, November 17. So how does all of this factor in with the peace deal and the elections, who's going to be president? How does all this factor in together? Look, I think this is, is very crucial, as you mentioned, that um, uh, there were nine rounds of talks, almost one year, complete years. Uh, the U.S. was talking to the Taliban, and uh, the fair, I think there was a lot of expectations that now the deal, the deal, and the deal was supposed to be signed, uh, but unfortunately, without any, uh, without giving any reason, proper reason, this killing of one U.S. soldier, I think that is not a proper, that is not a valid reason, and mm -hmm. we can't say that uh, President Trump uh, pulled out of talks for the reason that one American soldier was killed. Previously, when they were they, 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 they were in the process of talking to each other, a number of such casualties happened, a number of. Uh, 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 Afghan uh, security forces were targeted by uh, uh, by the Taliban, but U.S. never, uh, never, never pulled out of the process and even never complained uh, because already uh, they, they agreed that it was uh, they, 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 they were talking to each other and they were fighting with each other. So it was talk talks and fight fight uh, type of an arrangement between uh, both the, op uh, both the, oppos the, oppos the opposing parties uh, inside Afghanistan. So I think that is still even the Taliban and why uh, Suhail Shaheen, he said that uh, we never expected that uh, this will happen because the next day uh, they were going to sign and the day it was signed. So after that, he said that we agreed to announce a ceasefire. Uh, but suddenly, uh, you know, that uh, President Trump, uh, as his nature is, that he's tweeted. And I think even Zalmay Khalilzad was not aware of it, but how he took this, this decision. Every, ev everyone was, I think, uh, it, it was surprised sad. that uh, what happened to President. But it is his, you know, his character of speaking by Twitter. Uh, it, it's, it's now very normal. It is a new normal for the, uh, for the Absolutely. American Absolutely. There are no formal channels being no used No formal channels. And, and, and now, now, now this new normal is, I think, uh, now it is practical. Uh, in the U.S. administration, while speaking with the world, uh, with, with the world leader, sometimes the administration is not aware, and the president uh, says something. Why has Twitter me wake up early in the morning? So he has everybody is waiting for the president Trump tweets one. <coughs> and then they have to kind of follow what he Yeah, then they have to. Uh, uh, they, 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 they have to right. adjust that. Uh, <coughs> sorry, right. and the next is the this is Afghan presidential election. I think definitely elections are. Uh, uh, held in a very peaceful, uh, relatively very peaceful environment, and the Afghan administration themselves conducted it. It was, uh, it was the biggest, I think, uh, uh, process uh, which they did uh, without having any any support from the from the American or international forces. That is one thing. But on the other side, I don't expect that this this election will have a normal result. That on 24 or 27 of this uh, 2017 of this month. 
uh, of November, uh, we may not, I think, uh, be able to hear that uh, one is the winner. Either Ashraf Ghani is the winner, either Dr. Abdullah is the winner, or Dr. Uh, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar is the winner, because it's a very complicated process of the Afghan election. You have to take 50 percent plus one. So that is last time too in 2014 uh, when Dr. Abdullah, he scored uh, 45.6 while Dr. Ashraf Ghani was at 33.6, uh, 33 point plus uh, something uh, and they went into the second round. In the second round, we saw Dr. Ashraf Ghani uh, go past uh, the 50 and he got 55 plus person while Dr. Abdullah remained there at 47. So uh, and then you know what happened after that. So this time too both the both 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 claim victories uh, prior letting mm -hmm. the election commission count the and votes their allegations and, and, and they say every person said that we have we, we, we are dead sure that we got the, the required number of votes and both say that there will be no second rounds of it. So I, I don't think so that the new administration will be a powerful administration. Uh, to talk straight uh, with the Taliban and neither the Taliban, I think, so far they haven't shown any leniency <coughs> to negotiate uh, with the government. So far they say uh, we will talk to the Afghan and this Afghan delegation may include the government people, but they will be in the, they will be in, in the team as in their own private capacity, in their individual capacity. Right. So uh, what, what I see in Afghanistan, uh, if the U.S. and the Taliban who have clear objective of four points, withdrawal, uh, uh, not the land not to be used by any terror syndicate, etc., <clears throat> and the ceasefire. Uh, so these four or five points can be easily agreed with. But unfortunately, it took more than a year, and they are continuously talking to each other. Now think of when Afghans sit with the Afghans, and they start negotiating the future setup uh, in, in Kabul. So I think that is where the devils lie, I think. Right. So that's going to uh, be another uh, process. And so there, there's going to be another in a very, I think, very difficult process. Yeah. Right. So already uh, it's been indicated that 2,000 troops have been, U.S. troops have been withdrawn from Afghanistan already. And they're expecting that around 8,000 plus troops are going to remain there. So that is sort of uh, what uh, the final result of the peace agreement might be. Some troops will remain. And uh, is is this in line with what the Taliban may be demanding and also in, in your opinion and also um, the US side if they're to resume talks is this going to be based on uh, the reduction in violence by the Taliban which we've seen it went up that uh, time last month when the peace talks suddenly stopped look I think this is the, this is the main demand it's not only of the US of the Afghan government of the regional countries also when uh, Pakistan, Beijing, and uh, China, and in, uh, in Moscow, <coughs> in Russia, when they were in Moscow last week, uh, they also demanded a fair reduction in violence. They said that if Taliban uh, are not agree to announce a formal ceasefire, at least they reduced a visible uh, reduction in the violence. And this is what the U.S. administration also uh, desire. That uh, definitely, uh, the, it, now the Taliban in a hurry to resume talks because mm. they have a lot of expectations and they did very well in the on the table while talking for almost a year with the US administration but the biggest loss of uh, pulling out of the of the talks is not for the US that much it is more for the Taliban and that's the reason that soon after um, uh, the scuttling of the process, the Taliban delegation went to Moscow, they went to Beijing, they went to Iran and they came to Islamabad just to convince them that to convince the US administration to resume the talks from where we have stopped it. Right. So I think this is the Taliban, uh, the, the Taliban are more desirous to resume but definitely the US is also interested. You might have heard Zalmay Khalilzad speaking to the people that the US is uh, definitely interested in the resumption of talks, but there is a condition and the condition is fair level of reduction in violence. Mm -hmm. Taliban because has at the no. end of the day, it's the civilians there who have taken the largest so, toll. Yeah, so far is the civilians, mm -hmm. is the women, is the children and is the ordinary people who are suffering for the rest. Mm -hmm. You look at that uh, bomb blast last week in, in, in Ningarhar, in the mosque, uh, more than 60s, uh, almost 100 people died in there. So it is callous, I think, it's too much. Uh, Delhi, uh, ordinary people, they are getting killed in mosques, in imam bargas, in hojras, in markets, everywhere, in, 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 in colleges, in educational institutions. So I think I'm also of the opinion that uh, Afghans are already suffering. The ordinary Afghans are already suffering. So instead of rushing to the to the talks and instead of rushing to the conclusion, this is the responsibility of the regional countries, which include Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, to convince Taliban 
that before uh, anyone, the U.S., that before we're drawing from, uh, we're drawing its troops from Afghanistan and the Taliban, before pushing them to talk, uh, let's talk again, I think they must show uh, the, the sense of uh, uh, what we call it a willingness that they, they are willing to reduce, uh, to, to, to go for a ceasefire. So, okay, if they are not announcing a public ceasefire, at least they reduce or at least they say that these places will not be targeted. Like, like already they have uh, in, in, in the earlier agreement, um, the, the, the education institutions, the markets, right. the civilian will not be targeted. But so yet I, they are. No, no, not there. Huh? What is this? This what happened in uh, in, in Nengarha mm. when a mosque was attacked. Yeah. So I think, and again, this is uh, the, the Afghan is a very difficult uh, battleground. I think you don't know who is doing what. Yes, and so sometimes some mm. some Taliban say we haven't done it. Then they say it is done by the Daesh or by yeah. the IMU or by etc. So there are a number of terrorist other terrorist organizations also. So at least Taliban must take the responsibility as an Afghan to show willingness that they want uh, end to this war. And yeah. for that, I and think the must condition is, the yes, the yeah. first step shall be, if you are not announcing the ceasefire, at least they reduce uh, the, the violence where the Taliban are in control of, uh, in the areas where they are in control. Right. So, and from the U.S. perspective, it's mostly from the angle that the United States, uh, the public there is kind of wary of all their presence in foreign countries and all of their uh, wars that have been going on, endless wars, so-called. And uh, when uh, President Trump was elected into office, he he promised the United States public that he's going to stop all these endless wars. And Afghanistan is the longest war the U.S. has had, 18 years. So um, from the uh, perspective of the elections in the United States, they, do you think that this is one of the main reasons that they're pushing for the ceasefire and for the U.S. Uh, troop control? Look, I think I see the U.S. administration in a bit hurry uh, to just lock the door and um, yeah. go back. Uh, to their home from Afghanistan. I think that will be a nightmarish for the regional countries. Like what also. just happened in Syria. So I, yeah, what's happening in Syria. And last time we saw the same uh, withdrawal of Soviet forces from Afghanistan in 1989. Uh, and, and then again, there was internal war, internal feud between the various Afghan, Afghan factions. So I think this time, uh, it is the responsibility of the regional countries, particularly Pakistan, China, Russia, and Iran, to let the U.S. complete the job. I think they must, U.S. is definitely in a hurry. They want to quit, they want to leave it, and as President Trump has time and again said it, that it is not our responsibility to be the police uh, in Kabul, to be the police, to do the police duties in Kabul or in Afghanistan. But at least I think at this moment, definitely U.S. is in a hurry. They want to quit, they want to take their forces Due back. Due to the and 2020 the, president. The, 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 the internal, uh, the, the, the internal uh, uh, compulsions, like the, the 2020, uh, 2020 elections, plus uh, they are spending billions of dollars, I think, and they are also taking human uh, uh, human casualties. Uh, so, so definitely, they, it may be their plan. But at least, when you were you were here, you were here for 18 years, uh, to, since 2001 and now 2019. So, instead of just rushing out of the field. I think this is the U.S. moral responsibility, the political responsibility to complete the job. Till the time Taliban agreed with the Afghan factions, with the, Afghan, uh, with the, with the other Afghan for, uh, uh, groups, that they agreed on a certain setup, on a certain administrations, uh, which, which, which factions will have uh, w uh, what, what type of uh, uh, shares in the administrations, what will be the future uh, polity or the future regime, uh, administration of Afghanistan. Until and unless, I think uh, nobody will support the U.S. to withdraw from Afghanistan. Right. So, uh, so, and, and up till now, during all these peace talks, the nine rounds of peace talks, President Ashraf Ghani was the, the strongest critic of whatever was being decided over there in these peace talks. Now, uh, naturally, his government or whichever Afghan government is going to come into place next month, they're going to have to be on the same page with whatever is decided between the United States and the Taliban. So what prospects do you see of an intra-Afghan dialogue that's owned by Afghans and uh, just amongst Afghans themselves to decide what's best for that country and to bring all these factions together? I think as, as knowing the Afghan psyche, it's too difficult for me to say that I am 
even optimistic about having something uh, the, 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 toward the settlement of this Afghan conflict. If we leave it to the Afghans, I think the Afghans have this problem. Afghan is not, their division is not only uh, on the religion ground or an ethnic ground. It is even on the regional, um, uh, regional basis also. So it is it's going to be too difficult uh, for the Afghan to cobble up a peace uh, type of a, a thing uh, we call, uh, which they agree. Uh, we, we saw these Afghans when the seven um, uh, Mujahideen commanders, when in 1989 there was a Geneva accord, post Geneva accord, what happened? Uh, we saw they were fighting first with the government and when the government, when Dr. Najib government uh, went away from the scene, so they start fighting with each other. So this time too, uh, unless and until, I think definitely as I said earlier, that if the US and the Taliban talks take more than a year, so definitely the intra-Afghan talks will take a double time of this. Okay. So till that time, it is the responsibility of the international community, particularly the regional countries and the US to stay there and ensure that Taliban doesn't rush to take the whole uh, the whole things okay. or e even any other groups uh, for that matters they just go and take the big share of it so I think it is there is because Afghanistan this this the conflict of Afghanistan is not only of the Afghans we are also stakeholders in it as a Pakistani because we suffered a lot due to the Afghan conflict I think the international community has a lot of stakes in Afghanistan the the the, the Central Asian countries the Iran even the, the whole region so I think just leaving it to the Afghan, then I am not optimistic that they will, they, they will do something out of it. I think I, I, I definitely I would like the international, the US must be on the table. These regional countries must be backing uh, uh, this process, this intra-Afghan process until and unless uh, they, they reach an agreement. And if we just say, okay, now we have, we, we have fulfilled our responsibility, we set both the party to talk to each other and now our job is finished. I think that will be a nightmarish situation, uh, not only for again for the Afghan, but for the region and particularly for Pakistan. Thank you so much, Mr. Hassan Khan, for joining us and giving your insights you today. Um, and now uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about the situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir, which is now nearing the end of its third month of uh, the lockdown and the uh, communications blackout and the situation as it is. And uh, yesterday, Pakistan and the entire world observed a black day uh, for all these human rights violations that are taking place in Indian occupied Kashmir. We have with us online uh, Lieutenant General Naim Khalid Lodi, who's a former defense minister. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Hey, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, sir, so now that the situation in Indian occupied Kashmir is almost at the end of its third month, and the, uh, in, in terms of the black day that was observed yesterday, um, Pakistan uh, didn't allow Prime Minister Modi's flight the uh, right to use its airspace on its way to Saudi Arabia. What sort of an impact do you believe that this would have, this kind of a, a move would have, and previously also we've denied the, the airspace to Prime Minister Modi as well as the president, um, India's president. So what kind of an impact do you think this would have on uh, India? Uh, thank you very much. First, uh, if you allow, I'll just uh, take a minute to talk about this three-month curfew which is there. Uh, actually, in my own assessment, uh, it is a failure of uh, Indian Army in their first phase According to uh, their own uh, assessment, they had thought that uh, they will be able to suppress the 400 to 450 freedom fighters, the local freedom fighters uh, who, who were fighting for uh, the freedom of their uh, land. Uh, in uh, their own assessment, was they will do it in about 10 to 15 days, and I think uh, that was a good enough time uh, for a force which is uh, more than three lakhs. Total force is nine lakh, but at least. Three lakhs are uh, employed just uh, for this purpose, which I just uh, mentioned. So if they have not been able to control them in three months, it is, uh, you know, about more than 85 or 86 days. Uh, so it is quite clear that uh, the things are out of their hands. And if there was any uh, very few Kashmiris left earlier who, who were uh, supporting the BJP government or the Congress government, now it, the number must be zero. There is not a single Kashmiri in Indian occupied Kashmir which will now vouch for Indian government or uh, even to stay with India. And uh, their, their leadership has been saying very openly that uh, the Qaeda was right and we were wrong. So uh, that is, uh, you know, as far as that thing is concerned. Now, uh, you know, uh, stopping the flights, so these are just, uh, uh, one say, these are the things which are, uh, which do not have a lot of effect, effect except for a diplomatic uh, signal uh, that uh, we are annoyed 
and we are standing with our Kashmiri brethren and these, these steps have to be taken otherwise Kashmiris would think that uh, you know on one side uh, uh, so much of harassment and uh, uh, clamp down and curfew is going on and the other, on the other side Pakistan is trying to you know culture some goodwill or something so uh, that that message has to go but right, so, I, will, mm. I will have to add if you allow just uh, 30 more seconds that only diplomatic measures even if the whole world tries to help us they will not come for the help physically. Uh, it is only the Kashmiris themselves and the Pakistan standing by them that will change the tide of the Kashmiri uh, situation. Nothing else will change it. Right. Thank you so much, General Lodi, for joining us on our program today. That's all, we, all the time we have for today's program on uh, Newsroom. We'll see you next time on Newsroom at the same time, same place, 5.05 p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. on weekdays. That's bye-bye from me, Sharmeen Ali, and our team at Newsroom.